Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming and attending this talk. Firstly, I would like to thank the EuroPython team for giving me this amazing opportunity. This is my first tech talk in person, and I'm equally excited and nervous. Now, before we get to the main presentation, let me quickly introduce myself. Hi, I'm Ria, and I'm currently working as a software engineer in the fintech industry. Now, over the course of my career, I worked with multiple database systems and evaluated different technologies. What makes learning even more fun and exciting for me is to understand the whys and hows, how things are exactly working behind the scenes, and then breaking the complex topics into easy, understandable bits. I'm also very passionate about organizing outreach initiatives for women in STEM and giving back to the community in whatever way possible. In my free time, I love to play my musical instruments, and I also enjoy reading. So what should you expect from today's talk? Firstly, we talk a lot about RocksDB and its features, but the purpose here is to dive deep and understand what's happening under the hood with respect to storage and retrieval. We'll see how you can talk to RocksDB using Python, and as I take you through some of the fundamentals along the way, I really hope that by the end of this presentation, you're not just excited to get started with Rocks, but are equally enthusiastic to know more about other database systems out there. So without further ado, let's get started. Starting from the absolute basics. What's a database? On the most fundamental level, a database should do two things. When you give it a data record, it should store that data record. And when you ask for that data record again, it should give it back to you. Simple. With this, let's also clear a common misconception. Many people think that the database and the DBMS are one of the same things. Well, the database is where your data is actually saved, while the DBMS is a software program that manages this database and decides how data would actually be laid out. So you could think of the DBMS as the brain of your database, which is responsible for querying, creating, or modifying anything in your database and even sending the requested response back to the users. Together, this system is called a database system. So all the popular databases that you might have heard of, like MySQL, Postgres, RocksDB, SQLite, all these are database management systems. Now, with so many options available in the market, how do you choose the right one for your application? This decision greatly influences the performance, the scalability, and the overall success of your project. So should you go for something that has always worked for you, something you're familiar with, or should you choose uh, something that is more aligned to the use case and explore the possibilities? Well, before we tackle that question, let's use a database time machine and let me take you back to an important era in the history of databases. Now, this was the time between early 2000s and late 1990s when relational databases dominated the domain. Now, these databases stored data in the form of neatly structured tables with predefined columns. Data could be spread across uh, multiple tables, and each of these shared close relationships. And actually, that was the beauty of a relational database. The data integrity, the reliability, and the dependable re data retrieval that it provided. Now, in order to talk to a relational database, you would need something called as a structured query language, so you could write complex queries, and the database management engine is entirely capable of joining data from multiple tables and precisely giving you what you had asked for. Now, for a time, relational databases were the perfect solution. Fast forward to 2000s, the internet explodes, and so does the amount of data. And suddenly, relational databases started to buckle under the pressure. Now, designed for an entirely different era, they couldn't handle the massive scale and the blazing speed demands of modern world applications. Developers started to feel the bottlenecks due to slow queries and performance issues, and there was a need for a new solution. Enter NoSQL databases. Now, these newcomers tossed out the rule book and adopted to more flexible data storage formats. So unlike their relational counterparts, they adopted flexible data storage formats, each optimized for a specific need. For example, key value stores, like Redis and DynamoDB, where uh, you could store key value pairs, unique keys mapped to your values. And the power of them is the USP, which key value stores have, is the fast data retrieval and the flexibility that they offer. 
or couch db like mongo db or uh, uh, a couch DB, which are document-based DBs that store data in form of JSON documents, offering a middle ground between flexibility and structure. Now, as we talked about this evolution of databases, a clear pattern emerges. Each new generation of database tried to build upon the strengths of its predecessor while also handling its limitations. So whether it was the performance issues or the rigidity of relational databases or the earlier scalability challenge of NoSQL solution. Now, as and how technology advances and more and more data gets generated, we need something even more high performance and advanced. Enter RocksDB, the star of our afternoon. So RocksDB is not just another database, but it's the response to the high performance and low latency needs of modern world applications. And before we talk about its capabilities, let me quickly ask you, have you ever used RocksDB before? A quick show of hands. Great. So even if you have not directly interacted with Rocks, you have certainly used a service that depends on it. So Facebook uses RocksDB as its storage engine in many of its data management services. LinkedIn uses RocksDB for real-time analytics and stream processing. Similarly, Uber, Pinterest, Netflix, Airbnb, all these tech giants are using RocksDB. So somewhere or the other, you have directly or indirectly interacted with Rocks. Now, RocksDB is a key value store. What that means is that it stores key value pairs. Now, this could be a traditional row in your row store, where the key could be the unique identifier of the row, and the value could be the values associated with the columns. Or it could be a more flexible data storage format, like a JSON document, where the key is the row ID, and the value is whatever is next to the row ID. Or it could just be a blob of bytes that you don't have to worry about, and the application sitting on top understands how to decode these. With this, now let's get to the fun and exciting part, Rocks TV and Python. So today I'll show you how you can use Python to harness the power of one of the fastest databases in the world. Let's get started. Before that, let me tell you that Rocks TV is an embedded database. Now, with traditional database system, where the application connects to the database server running on a separate host machine as a separate server process over the network, RocksDB sits directly with your applications. So it's running as a part of the same process space. Now, with a separate server removed, a lot of complexity is removed from the picture. Uh, there's no overhead of network communication, it offers minimal latency, making it a perfect solution for applications demanding high performance and responsiveness. So RocksDB is primarily built in C++, and uh, you first have to download it from source, you build it to a shared library, and then you can integrate it with your applications. It's uh, compatible with multiple applications, multiple languages, like C++, Java, Rust, Go, and of course, Python. So for your Python applications to talk to RocksDB, you need something called as a Python RocksDB package. Now what this is doing is basically in very simple terms, allowing your application to speak the language that RocksDB's C++ core understands. So it's like a translator. When you put something or take something out of the database using a Python command, it's the Python RocksDB package that's handling this communication under the hood. And as we continue to talk about RocksDB, let me quickly share a quick fun fact about me, that I'm a big time foodie. And if you are too, you too understand the importance of a well-stocked pantry. So help me build a nifty little app where we use RocksDB to track the quantity of my favorite food items. And as soon as you install Python RocksDB package, you can get started. So you all have to do, all you have to do is import RocksDB, create an instance, and insert the key value pairs. You do that using the put operation. So here the key is my favorite food item, and the quantity is the quantity that I have for that item. And as I'd earlier promised, we'll not just see how you can use Python with RocksDB, but actually understand what's happening under the hood when you trigger this operation. The reason for RocksDB's popularity is its blazing performance. And the secret sauce is actually log structure merge trees. Now this architecture organizes RocksDB's data into this efficient hierarchy of in-memory and levels on disk. Let's see what's happening. So when you do a put 
when you insert something in the database, the writes are actually being written in RAM, in an in-memory buffer. So writing something to RAM versus writing in randomly on disk is magnitudes faster. A simple analogy, it's like you keeping your items on a nearby kitchen counter table. As soon as you bought the items, you just dump the items right there. The records are inserted in a sorted order, so as you add more key value pairs, you will notice that the sorted order is maintained. Now, once the in-memory buffer is full, RocksDB triggers a flush. What this does is that RocksDB writes the in-memory buffer elements to a file on disk, which is called as a sorted string table. So it's like moving your items, once the table is full, to a nearby kitchen cabinet. Now this newest arrival section of your kitchen cabinet is, uh, of RocksDB is called as level zero. Now your table is free again to take more rights, so let's add some more items. Now earlier in the day, I purchased some bananas, so I have to add that. Uh, I also ate some cake and I have to update its quantity. I'd already added cake earlier before. And I finished all my donuts. Guess I needed some sugar rush before the presentation. So now, let's add the items. You add bananas, but here's what happens in case of updates. Now I want to update the quantity of cake. Once you write something to RocksDB, and once it's persisted on disk, it becomes immutable. Nothing will be changed, so you won't go and modify the value that you have already written. Rocks, uh, so SST is basically an immutable data structure. And how it's different from B-trees, which are actually the architecture behind relational databases like MySQL, Postgres, that they are mutable and in place. So what happens is that, for example, over here, if I have to modify my record number eight, I first have to fetch that record, actually have to fetch the entire page into memory. Even if I just want to modify one record, the entire page is fetched into memory. I modify the record and write it back to disk. So this is an in-place update that you are modifying the existing value. In case of rocks, you just create a new key value pair with the same key and the updated value. None of the existing values are getting modified. For deletes, you do the same thing. Nothing is being physically erased from the database. You create a new key value pair with the same key and a special value called as a tombstone. Now this value is basically telling RocksDB that this record is no longer valid. Now our in-memory buffer is full again and it's time to trigger a flush. So now this file is also written as an SSD file on level zero, and as more and more data gets inserted, we get more and more SSD files, you would soon notice an issue, that we have duplicate values sitting at level zero which we no longer need. There are updates, there are deletes, which is just occupying unnecessary space and cluttering our database. So here, RocksDB employs a clever strategy called as compaction. What it does is, that it merges the SSD files into another SSD files. It's very simple, uh, similar to sorting to merge uh, to sorted lists, merging to sorted lists. So for example, over here, you take apples, you take bananas. For cake, you take the updated value. And in case of deletes, the value would be nullified because we have just two SSD files at the moment. Now this compacted new SSD becomes a part of level zero. RocksDB has reclaimed the space and taken care of all the duplicates and the, the deletes which were sitting there just cluttering our level zero, our cabinet. Now as more and more data gets added, RocksDB triggers this periodic flush which would result in one or more SSD files and soon level zero would hit its configurable size limit. Now what RocksDB does is that it shifts level zero to level one. Now this is just a logical shift, nothing is being copied or rewritten, and it's synonymous to you moving your items from a smaller rack to a bigger rack. Notice this, that everything in level zero will be in sorted order, there are no overlaps, because compaction of level zero has already handled that. But level zero would continue to have these overlaps as in how things are getting flushed from the in-memory buffer. Now, what happens now is that compaction now gets triggered between the overlapping files of level zero and level one. So RocksDB takes care of all the updated values, the deletes, the updates, 
merges all these files and persists them. Now, these are the overlapping files that you see on your screen. These are then persisted to level one. Soon, level one would also reach its configurable size limit as this compaction gets triggered. And now, RocksDB shifts this to level two. Again, synonymous to moving it from a mid-size cabinet to even larger cabinet. And ultimately, we get a structure like this. So you see, all the older data is getting pushed to the lower levels, while the upper, data, the upper levels have the freshest data. Let me summarize the write flow for you. So first, you write to the in-memory buffers, really fast. It's, it's just a write to RAM. Now, once the mem table is full, you flush it to disk as a SSD file. Now, as the number of SSD files in level zero increases, RocksDB triggers the compaction, merges these SSD files, and once level zero hits its size limit, it's shifted to level one. Now, this ongoing compaction keeps on happening between level zero, level one, level one, level two, and this is how RocksDB manages the data size and also optimizes the read performance. We'll see how. This is how writes happen in RocksDB. Moving on to the reads, now, for the reads, you use the get operation to get something out of the database. Now, for example, here I'm trying to find the key pasta. My natural response would be to first check my table, if my record is right there, if it was a recent purchase. So I check the in-memory buffer first, that if I can find the record over there. If yes, great. If not, then you have no other option but to check your cabinets. So you start with level zero, that is your newest arrival section cabinet, and you start with the latest SSD file that just got pushed, because that has the probability of having your data, the latest value of your data. In case the record is found there, great. If not, then you have to drill down the levels one by one and try to find the record. In this case, your record is available in the last level, and yes, life is good but not really. Here you are scanning each and every SSD file one by one to find the record. And this will really mess up the read performance. You have to open all the files. Suppose there are thousands and thousands of files. And just to find one record, you have to look at all the files. That's not really optimal for your reads. How can we optimize this? If we had something in memory, something like a signboard that could help us finding this record, something that could lead us directly to our records, it would be great, right? That's what indexes does. So indexing, whenever I talk about indexing, people tend to get really confused, but it's actually a very simple concept. So what index, indexing does is, your data records are actually stored as blocks. Now all you have to do for indexing is use some extra space store the key that you have been looking for, and the value of where you will find that record. So in this case, this is a full index. What RocksDB does, it's that it uses a sparse index to optimize the space. So this sparse index just gives you enough information to reach the record that you have been looking for. For example, if you're trying to find pasta, all you have to do is use the index, find this block, and then fetch it to memory and find the record that you have been looking for. But can I get even more precise? Before even fetching the block, can I get some information if that block contains my data or not? For example, from this, I cannot figure out if pasta is actually there or not. That will only happen once I have fetched that block to in memory. There you use Bloom filters. Now, Bloom filters is this magical, amazing data structure that really optimizes your read performance. It's a space efficient and probabilistic data structure. How it helps is, is basically it optimizes your reads. So it gives you a yes or a no answer. What it does is that when you ask the Bloom filter, hey, do you have the key cupcake? And the Bloom filter says, yes, I do. Then you go and fetch the index and reach the data block that you have been looking for. But there's a catch. Bloom filters can give you a false positive. And that is what makes them probabilistic. So if, the bloom, if you ask the Bloom filter, hey, do you have donuts? And the Bloom filter says, yes, it's actually a maybe. So this would also lead you to go and fetch the index, but there's a possibility that you will not find the record. Where Bloom filters actually shine is the no scenario. So once the Bloom filter says, no, I do not have chocolates, 
you can be absolutely sure that the record is not over there. So a no means no, but a yes means a maybe for Bloom filters. Now, these two data structures are actually a part of disk. They are stored on disk, and they are part of the SST files. And uh, this is how the SST file looks like. There are data blocks, there's the index block, the Bloom filter block, and you fetch them on need-to-know basis. Now, the, we have, again, reached the same problem that how do we reach the Bloom filter and the index now? We don't have any information about that. So here, RocksDB uses its metadata file. Now, if you're trying to find the record, say, pasta, RocksDB has this information in its metadata file that just keeps track of all the SST files and the key ranges that they are storing, the smallest and the largest key range. So for this case, RocksDB narrows down to these two files. And for in case you do not find it in level one, uh, level zero, you have to find it in level one, this SST file. So these are the shortlist candidates. Again, let me summarize it for you. So first, you check the in-memory buffer. If the record is found, great. If not, you have to scan the disk. So now, metadata file helps you shortlist the candidates. OK, these two SSD files could potentially have your data. Now, once you have shortlisted it, you start searching it. So first, you fetch the Bloom filter. If the Bloom filter says yes, then you fetch the index block. Then from the index block, you actually reach the right data block that might contain your data. Now, please remember, Bloom filter does give false positives, so it's not a guarantee that you'll find the data or not. But if the Bloom filter says no, then you could stop your search right there and move on to the next SST file. And similarly, that would happen on every level. Now, you ha would have noticed that the writes are really fast, but for the reads, uh, RocksDB has to scan multiple levels, and that's a trade-off. So the good thing about RocksDB is that it's highly tweakable. You could configure it in the way that you want to. So you could optimize it for your workloads. For example, for optimizing reads, you could have a special in-memory buffer, another buffer called as a block cache, where you would cache all your frequently used Bloom filters or index blocks. So when you read the in-memory buffer, the next place that you check is actually the block cache. If your record is found there, you would save yourself a trip to the disk. For optimizing writes, rather than using one in-memory buffer, you could use two in-memory buffers. The problem with one is that as soon as it fills up, RocksDB has to trigger the flush, and writes would stall. So use two so that when one fills up, the other one becomes immutable, and the, the one which is active continues to receive the writes while the other one can get flushed. Please remember that configuring RocksDB is not a trivial task, and uh, you really have to understand your data patterns, your workload. You have to do a lot of experimenting and benchmarking to reach the right configuration set that you have been looking for. With this, we come to an end of our database world journey. Uh, in the end, uh, I would just like to say that it's important to make an informed choice by understanding what's happening inside your database would really help you optimize your applications. Um, and ultimately, it's a game of trade-offs. There is no right or wrong solution to anything. It's all about balancing the needs and then choosing what's a best fit for you. Thank you so much for attending this talk. I'm so glad uh, that I got this opportunity. If you have any questions or any feedback for me that can help me improve for my future talks, please let me know. Uh, or if you just want to bond over tech, books, or music, I'm glad to do that. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you very much, Ria, for this wonderful presentation and this insight into the world of databases. So we have the opportunity to ask some questions. Oh, great. There is one already. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, from your examples, I didn't um, know exactly how RocksDB deals with concurrency. Maybe you can say a little bit about concurrent writes and reads. Yes. So uh, RocksDB has, uh, can support multiple concurrent writes and reads with multiple threads. It, uh, for multi-processing, you can just have one process. It doesn't work in a multi-process fashion. So uh, with multiple uh, with uh, multi-threading, you can support concurrent reads and writes. So all the put, get, and uh, there are more operations as well, the delete, the merge, all these are thread safe. And what's really happening is the writes actually happen in a serial order only. So multiple. Uh, threads can try to write, but 
at one single point of time, only one thread would be modifying the in-memory data structure. In case of reads, RocksDB uses a snapshot isolation. So you are just reading that version, and that won't interfere with the concurrent writes. So for example, uh, if my thread starts to read the database, and it just takes a snapshot, and this is what I would see unless till the time I stop reading. And then the other thread would have the next version. That's what multi-version control system is. So it's, it's a versioning-based read, so it doesn't uh, really interfere with the concurrent writes. Cool. Thanks. Do we have more questions? For me, as a beginner, I was wondering, you know, as a beginner also in the use of, you know, high-performance yeah. databases, what would be your takeaway, you know, when, what should I keep in mind, you know, when to consider RocksDB as one possible database? I mean, in the introduction, you said a few things, but yeah. as a takeaway. Okay, so um, when you are aiming for low latency applications, for example, caching or session management or uh, high frequency trading systems, which are like closer to your user application, then RocksDB becomes a good fit. Uh, also, it's a NoSQL database, so um, when your data, when there are no structure requirements for your data, that your data doesn't, by the way, RocksDB also supports transactions, so that is like an added benefit. Uh, it can be ACID compliant if you are looking for uh, relational properties in a RocksDB instance. Also, I would like to mention that RocksDB is actually used as a storage engine at many places, uh, as not just as a standalone database. So like Facebook uses RocksDB with, like MySQL is Facebook's actual product. Uh, now they are using uh, MyRocks. That is actually the storage engine is RocksDB, and it has the SQL engine sitting on top. So it gives you all the SQL capabilities with RocksDB's LSM and the performance capability. Similarly, TIKV is a database that is geo-replicated and that can be used as a, that uses RocksDB under the hood. So, so it's very versatile. Yes, so it's, it's a versatile database. And uh, recently, OpenAI acquired RockSet that is using RocksDB as its storage engine and uh, so, uh, like so in AI also. Many possibilities. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. We have one more question. Yep. Um, how can I use RocksDB in a high, high availability configuration? Hi, yeah, that, that is what I said. So RocksDB doesn't, is not a distributed database. You would have to write your own application logic, or you would, I mean, use, use it as a storage engine to optimize your uh, performance, because the writes are in memory, and it gives you the persistence of disk. So uh, as I just mentioned, it's used as a storage engine at more places, and you have to write your own application logic to support. For example, CockroachDB, if you have heard of that, that uses rocks as its storage engine. Uh, similarly, the TIDB uses rocks as a storage engine. They have implemented their own fault tolerance and uh, redundancy and all the protocols to support that database. But under the hood, it's rocks. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have one more question, maybe? That is not the case. Okay. All right, we're almost at the end of the session, so I think thank Ria once again. Thank you.